You know what? I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Can people move from the present into the past or future? Eyewitnesses report a woman materializing from thin air. Could she be a time traveler? An ancient stone structure suggests the incredible. Did ancient pagan worshippers practice human sacrifice in New Hampshire? Plants seem to possess strange powers, allowing them to detect human thought. Are they sentient beings with dark intent? Yep. It's a weird world. And I love it. One minute. I, I'm sorry, I just... Uh, I, I couldn't put this book down, The Time Machine, written in 1895 by H.G. Wells. With this one book, a hot new science fiction genre was born. The time travel story. Now, of course, there are endless books, and films, and TV shows on the subject, and the mind-boggling paradoxes of journeying across time. Great stuff. Shame the concept of time travel is just fiction, isn't it? Isn't it? On July 15th, 2006, famed science fiction author Whitley Strieber, best known for his books The Hunger and Communion, was out at the theater with his wife Anne and her friend Starfire Tor. Little did they know what would happen that night would rival anything found in Whitley's books. Nothing seems impossible to me anymore. I haven't talked about it very much. After dinner, Anne and her friend went into what they thought was an empty ladies' room. Well, it's a very small room, about uh, 10 by 12. There was nobody in that room except for Anne Streber and myself. So I was standing on these steps. No one went in it after the two of them went in it. And I was watching the entire time. Anne was a little bit before me, and she left and said she would wait for me outside. So I went outside, stood in front of the door, waiting for Starfire. As I slightly rounded the corner, coming out of the stall, a woman just materialized. Whoa! She didn't seem to understand where she was. She seemed confused, and then she just left the room. While I was standing there, a woman came out. I go out the door to the ladies' room, and Ann Streber rushes up to me, very, very excited. She says, a lady came out, but she didn't go in. A lady came out, but she didn't go in. This was pretty amazing, because we knew no one was in there when we went in. So how could someone have come out who was never in there in the first place? No one, absolutely no one, went in that bathroom. Who was this mysterious woman? And how could she have appeared from nowhere? For the eyewitnesses, this is no ghost story. For them, the answer is much weirder. Something altered the timelines. We were brought together like a bad edit of a film. And that's how we almost collided. Right. Two women go into an empty bathroom and three women come out. Is it really possible this mystery woman slipped through from another time? Is that weird or what? I say that's the weirdest weird or what yet. Yeah, it's pretty far out, but remarkably, time travel may indeed be possible. And proof could soon be found in a 17-mile tunnel deep underground at the border of France and Switzerland. This is the Large Hadron Collider. A 17-mile-long tunnel designed to smash atoms together in an attempt to recreate conditions that last existed just before the Big Bang, when the universe was less than a 
trillionth of a second old. Scientists at the LHC are trying to understand what happened in that critical moment to make our universe what it is. By solving this, they hope to shed light on some of the most fundamental unanswered questions in physics. With the Large Hadron Collider, perhaps one day we'll be able to answer these cosmic questions. What happened before the Big Bang? Is it possible to go through a black hole? Can you bend time into a pretzel? We're now entering the cusp, the cusp of human progress. A hundred years ago, think how primitive we are. A hundred years from now, think of how advanced computers, artificial intelligence will be. Right now, we're at the most interesting point in human history, the cusp, when we're going to rocket through the universe. A complete understanding of how the entire universe is really constructed might enable future physicists to find a way to manipulate the fabric of space-time itself and travel into the past or future. But can we really manipulate time? To find out, we first need to investigate the time itself. Isaac Newton imagined time as an arrow, always traveling straight forward in one direction. But then Albert Einstein came along and said that time is more like a river that can meander, flow at different speeds, and even eddy back upon itself. Now we look at a river and we think of the, the spot on the river where we are is something like the present moment. And then upstream from us is the future. This is coming towards us. It's relentless. It's sort of inevitable. In a moment, what was up there is going to be here. And downstream from us, we can think of as the past. So these are events that have already happened. So there you have it. You've got the future. You've got the present moment. You've got the past. Is it possible? to go against the flow of time into the future or move even further downstream into the past? Going back in time is simple, theoretically. All we need to do is beat light to its destination, travel faster than light speed. How fast is that? Well, as Albert Einstein figured out, light travels at a fixed and constant speed throughout the universe of 186,000 miles per second. And the space shuttle can travel around five miles per second, so we have a bit of a problem. But our hopes of meeting our ancestors aren't over yet. Modern physicists have built on Einstein's theories and discovered that although we may not be able to beat light in a head-to-head -head race, we might be able to cheat and take a shortcut. Going back in time is simple, theoretically. To do this, a time traveler would need to bend the fabric of space, connecting two distant points to create a theoretical tunnel through space and time known as a wormhole. There are two parallel universes. Perhaps it might be possible to build a gateway between these universes, a wormhole, a shortcut, like the looking glass of Alice. Think of Alice in Wonderland. She had a looking glass and she put her hand through it and her hand went to the other side of forever. That is a wormhole. But could we manipulate the very fabric of time and space? If we have something called negative matter or negative energy, it might be possible to build a gateway to another universe, a gateway to another point in space or time. Now, of course, in science fiction, we have the dilithium crystals of Star Trek, People talk about spice. People talk about other exotic chemicals that will open these gateways. Well, I'm a physicist. To us, it's negative matter or negative energy. Negative energy we can actually create in the laboratory. It's already been done, but only in microscopic quantities. Negative matter we've never seen before. If we can find a negative matter meteorite in outer space, just perhaps, maybe we can harness it to open a gateway to another universe. The only problem is the amount of energy required to punch a hole to the other side of the universe is impossible for us to achieve with our current technology. The trick is to assemble enough positive and negative energy in order to rip open the fabric of space and time. 
that's really hard. We're talking about the energy of a black hole, the energy of a star, in order to bend time into a pretzel. What do you mean it's impractical to go back in time, can't make a wormhole? What's wrong with these eggheads? Okay, so traveling into the past might be a tad beyond our reach, but here's something surprising. Most physicists believe it's possible, relatively easy in fact, to travel into the future. How do you exploit Einstein's theory of relativity to travel into the future? Well, it turns out it's not that hard to do. Now, it's hard from an engineering point of view. You just need a really fast spaceship, which we don't have. But if you had one, here's what you do. You just go on a long journey and come back home. Remarkably, this is possible because time behaves differently when an object or person travels at high velocity. It's called time dilation. If you move fast enough, your clock will disagree from a clock that's been left at home. Uh, a similar thing can happen if you uh, spend a lot of time in a strong gravitational field, like near a black hole, for example. This amazing feat has actually already been accomplished. Russian cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev has spent more time in space than any other human being. From 1988 to 2005, Krikalev spent 803 days orbiting the Earth at high speed. At times, Krikalev was traveling at 17,000 miles per hour. Nowhere near the speed of light, but fast enough to travel forward in time. It's only about 1 50th of a second, so it's almost too small to even notice. But he has aged just a little bit less than, let's say, if he had had a twin brother who had stayed on the ground. He's just a little bit younger than his brother would have been. Using this theory, it may be possible to travel thousands of years into the future. Imagine traveling all the way around the circumference of the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy. Now, it's very big. It's about 150,000 light years around. So it's going to take a long time. You start accelerating uh, at a rate of uh, 1g, which is the normal uh, force of gravity that you feel just sitting here. So you have this very mild acceleration, but you keep it up long enough, you're eventually going very fast. When you get halfway around, you start decelerating, and after many, many more years, you end up back on Earth where you started from. Here's the thing. To someone who has stayed at home and just watched you go, and is waiting for your return, they have a long wait, because it's going to take 150,000 years before you come back. But for you, from your point of view, on board this spaceship, only 23 years will have passed. So, although it seems impossible, time travel is, theoretically at least, real. And the Large Hadron Collider could yet witness science fiction become functioning science fact. In some theories where there's extra dimensions of space, in addition to the three that we see, little compact, tiny dimensions, extra dimensions of space, um, there's a speculative idea that uh, they may be able to make uh, a mini black hole in the Large Hadron Collider. So is it possible the mystery figure that appeared that night in Los Angeles was really a time traveler? Perhaps even from a future where science had finally answered the secrets of the universe and were now able to manipulate time? Could be. We physicists believe that if time travel is possible, all the paradoxes can be resolved if a parallel reality opens up and there are no contradictions. You simply change the past of another universe. This also means that perhaps in the future, our descendants may have the energy and the ability to create a time machine. So one day, if somebody knocks on your door and claims to be your great, 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 great granddaughter, don't slam the door. Is that weird or what? A mysterious set of stone structures in rural New Hampshire. Could this be a place of pagan worship and human sacrifice thousands of years old? The astronomical alignments are one of the uh, key um, pieces of evidence that the site is ancient. 
Does this mean ancient Europeans crossed the Atlantic thousands of years before Columbus? So it really does open up a whole different way to look at North American history. What is this place? Who built it? And what could its existence mean for America? Truth in history, it would seem, is a sliding scale. The facts that we know today may all crumble away with discoveries of tomorrow, and those discoveries are often to be uncovered in the most unlikely of places. For example, could an innocent-looking pile of rocks tucked away in the corner of a farmer's field in the northeastern United States challenge everything we think we know about American history. What if the first European to arrive in North America wasn't Christopher Columbus or even a Viking? What if instead of coming to New England in search of religious freedom, the first European settlers came to practice human sacrifice? In Salem, New Hampshire, a mysterious grouping of megalithic stones Standing 14 feet high, surround a compound that houses a maze of eight-foot-long chambers and crypts set into the ground. The centerpiece, a huge stone slab that looks like a sacrificial table. This is Dennis Stone. His family has owned the site for three generations, and he has an amazing theory. Stone believes that this is the oldest man-made structure in the entire United States. America Stonehenge may be one of the more important archaeological sites in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, there are different theories of who built the site. If it is in fact ancient and was built by old world people, um, this would demonstrate that people crossed the Atlantic Ocean a few thousand years before Christopher Columbus or even the Vikings came to America. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? The very idea that explorers predating Columbus by millennia might have crossed the Atlantic and made America their home? Well, before you dismiss the idea, consider this. It was only in 1960 that the Norwegian archaeologist Anne Ingstad was ridiculed when she proposed her idea that Vikings had settled North America in the 12th century. But it turned out to be true. Ingstad's discovery changed history, and the Viking settlement she found in Newfoundland, Canada, is now an official World Heritage Site. Could this structure have been built by mysterious ancient travelers? Stone believes similarities between his site and archaeological sites in Europe hold the key to uncovering the truth. We have a couple of chambers here that are very reminiscent of chambers found in uh, France, Ireland, uh, Spain, the Netherlands. One of the purposes we know of is that they were used for astronomical alignments with the sun, moon, and stars. And uh, there are just stone markers. The sun would rise or set over these stones, so the moon would do the same thing. And this may have been tied into the religious ceremonies, the longest day of the year, the shortest day of the year, or the equinoxes. And there's also stones that align with cross-quarter days, days in between the seasons. The ancient Celts and other cultures actually set up stones uh, which would mark these times. The Celts, a diverse group of tribes that dominated much of Central Europe until around 1600 years ago. Stone remnants of Celtic structures, including elaborate burial chambers, can be found all over Europe. It has also been suggested that the Celts were involved in the construction of England's most famous ancient megalith, Stonehenge, a site some believe was created as a giant astronomical tool. Its stones aligned to the solstice positions of the sun and moon. Did Celts come and settle America a thousand years before Columbus? In the 1970s, uh, Barry Fell, again a professor at Harvard, uh, stumbled upon a, a stone uh, carved here on site, and the kind of writing that was uh, on the stone, something called Iberian Punic. The Iberian Peninsula area at that time housed the Celts. David Brody is an amateur archaeological researcher. He supports the idea that the Celts, not Columbus, were the first Europeans to reach the New World. We think of the Celts as being from Ireland, but actually they originated in Central Europe and then went down to the Iberian Peninsula. But it's the Celts leaving the Iberian Peninsula region that, that I think came over here and, and established the site at America Stonehenge. This place is becoming weirder and weirder by the minute. 
Who the heck was it? Hanging around these woods all that time ago. And what were they doing? Could this site in New England share the same purpose as the original Stonehenge in Old England? A prehistoric monument of huge, carefully aligned stones assembled by ancient Britons for some mysterious pagan purpose? If the Celts did build this American Stonehenge as a religious site, then Dennis Stone has some striking ideas as to what ceremonies would have been performed here. I'm standing next to the sacrificial table. It's uh, one of the main features at America Stonehenge. This table measures about nine feet in length, six feet in width, and it sits on four stone legs. On the surface of the stone is a rectangular cutout or a groove that's been uh, made on the surface, and it has a little runoff. So if a ceremony of some type was taking place, a fluid could run through the channel and then run off the stone into a vase, perhaps. Although little is directly known of the Celts' religious practices, the Romans who fought them, and even Julius Caesar himself, often described how Celtic druids, or priests, carried out human sacrifice to honor their many pagan gods. The discovery of various ancient sites of ritualized murder in Europe may support this. The stone table in Salem also has another, even more bizarre feature, Dennis Stone calls an oracle tube. This tube goes through about eight feet, comes out underneath the sacrificial table. The voice would project out under the table during a ceremony, perhaps, and people would hear the voice and think it was a god or spirit talking to them. I am the god of the underworld. I accept your sacrifice. Remember, always obey the priest. When we find these large, elaborate stone structures, uh, historically, they were done to honor uh, gods for religious purposes, whether it's the pyramids or Stonehenge in England or Notre Dame Cathedral in, in Paris. The, when, when ancient man went to the effort to build something this elaborate, it was done for religious purposes. And again, that takes me back to the Celts, perhaps 500 BC. That's the type of thing that they did all over Europe at that time and would have done here if they came to America. America settled by Iron Age Europeans. It's an explosive theory but not one exactly shared by many experts. Research since the 1940s has shown there's a great deal of uh, differences between what we find in Ireland and what is found at this site. There are uh, major differences in uh, the architectural styles, there are differences in the engineering of how the buildings are put together. An expert in prehistoric stone structures, James Gage, also believes that an ancient civilization built this place, but based on carvings in the stone themselves, his theory is that the structure was created by a more local people, Native Americans. First and foremost is the large number of Native American artifacts that have been found at the site. And these artifacts range from, you know, uh, scrapers and projectile points, stuff we normally expect, to paint cups and rubbing stones, this evidence also includes uh, clay pottery that they were actually manufacturing on site. There was a, um, a small wetlands area where they were able to actually mine the clay and adjacent to it they had a small area where they were making the pots and firing them. One of the more interesting features about this site is it has a number of peck grooves, chipped out stone basins, and they're all been created by pecking out the stone using a hammer stone. And this uh, pecking technique is very distinctive to the Native Americans. The Celtic culture was a fairly advanced civilization. It had uh, metal tools, it had, they were making gold artifacts. We would expect them to use uh, you know, more advanced technology other than just simple hammer stones. The Native American theory makes obvious sense, but not according to David Brody. It is possible that the Native Americans did build the America Stonehenge site. Um, it would have been out of the ordinary for them to have done so, so I'm not inclined to think they did. They didn't typically, Native Americans in this area of the country did not typically build with stone. They had stone tools and they used stone to build their hearths, but they didn't build these elaborate structures typically out of stone. Once in a while it was his sweat lodge. But there's too many of these chambers here uh, in addition, the Native American tribes, although a lot of their history has been wiped out in the New England region, 
they don't take ownership of this site like they take ownership of other sites that they believe they did build. So I'm not going to tell you that they didn't do it, but I think the weight of the evidence is more in favor of some kind of ancient seafaring European civilization. So while these experts can't agree which ancient civilization built the American Stone Age, another archaeologist, Kenny Fetter, believes whoever is responsible wasn't ancient at all. Celts in New England 3,000 years ago? I don't think so, but okay. Archaeological sites where people were so neat that they picked every stinking artifact up and left no physical evidence behind? Not bloody likely. Okay. It looks like we're back to square one. So, who could it have been that built those incredibly weird structures? Was it the Celts? Not likely. The Native Americans? Maybe not. Well, how about another slightly less romantic theory? What if it was assembled by a couple of drunken 18th century farmers? If America Stonehenge is what I think it is, which is 19th century idiosyncratic structures, that doesn't make it any less important than if it's a 3,000 year old site with Celts traipsing around in southern New England. It makes it of different significance, but I don't think it makes it less significant. It just makes it different. Fetter's theory is the structures were constructed by the descendants of the Celts, the better known European settlers that came in the centuries after Christopher Columbus, bringing with them traditional ways of building stone structures. Yeah, damn right, they were Celts, but they were Celts from the 1800s and 1700s, because those are the people who moved here. Good point, but can't the more recent Celtic immigration theory explain the existence of the site's most macabre and enigmatic looking object? Why does American Stonehenge appear to have a sacrificial table? Look at the names of the towns, for example, in New Hampshire, around where America Stonehenge is located, the towns and the counties, places like Londonderry. Well, why is it called Londonderry? Because the people who lived here were from Great Britain. They were Celts. These stones are found actually throughout New England, so you're sort of left with a choice. Either there was a, there's this like widespread practice of human sacrifice throughout New England or we got something else going on and I think it's something else that's going on. If you Google lie stone or cider press stone, you'll actually come up with some uh, antique sites. They'll sell you stones like that. The deal is if you know something about historical technology, that historical process, we do know that the stones like that are found throughout New England. They were used for a number of kind of mundane purposes, not sacrificing people, but in fact making, making, making apple cider or producing lye soap. The deal is that an artifact like that, an object like that, is something that we, in the modern world, we suffer from kind of cultural amnesia. We don't press our own cider. We don't make lye soap anymore. And so the objects, the artifacts from that period that any little kid would be able to tell you, oh yeah, we use that for making soap. Today, it's, it's mysterious. So are the drainage grooves on the four-ton stone table actually for apple juice, not human blood? It may be the most plausible theory, but the mystery of the American Stonehenge cannot be cleared up quite so neatly. Charcoal pits at the site have been carbon dated and believed to be more than 2,000 years old. And Dennis Stone still believes his site is proof that an ancient people commemorated the coming of the solstices here, exactly as they may have done at the real Stonehenge. The astronomical alignments are one of the uh, key um, pieces of evidence the site is ancient. Uh, the alignments do not work today. They're off a certain amount due to the Earth's tilt changing. In 1977, we took four years' worth of survey data. We sent it to the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Mass. They ran it through the computer, and they said that if these were used for astronomical purposes, they would work about 1800 BC, plus or minus about 200 years. We have taken carbon datings on the hilltop, about 16 of them. In the main site, which is where we're standing right now, uh, the oldest carbon dating was 4,000 years old. This agrees pretty closely to the astronomical data and results. 
American Stonehenge could be proof that ancient Europeans traveled to North America thousands of years before Columbus. Or it could be a rare example of Native American stone building. Or it's just a really weird apple cider factory built by colonial farmers. Only one thing is for certain. The origins and purpose of American Stonehenge remains a mystery. Is that weird? Or what? Most people don't believe this. But I have a real green thumb. The secret to my success, I talk to my plants. I stroke them and I give them a little tender, loving care. Why? Because I believe plants, like humans, are emotional beings. They have feelings just like you and I do. They love, they fear, they can be affectionate, and they can communicate. You don't believe green matter has gray matter? No? Well. Of all the many different organisms that are on the planet Earth, common sense dictates that mammals are the most advanced, capable of thought, reasoning, and emotions. But shocking new evidence suggests that plants may possess these abilities as well. And even more mysterious, they may have the power of ESP. Is this science fiction? Or science fact, researchers attempt to establish interspecies communication. Is that weird or what? Our story begins in Italy where Carlo Cignazzi runs a 24-acre vineyard in the Tuscan Hills. A music lover, Carlo was well known to serenade his grape pickers with an accordion. <laughs> But in 2002, Carlo would stumble upon the true amazing power music could have when, as an ecologically friendly way of controlling pests from ruining his crop, Shignazi placed loudspeakers all around his vineyard to play 24-hour-a-day classical music. The pests were frightened away, but that's not all. Something else happened, something bizarre. The grapevines nearest the speakers grew 50% larger than the rest of the crop, matured more quickly, and even grew towards the source of the music. It's fantastic to see. It's impossible to, to, to believe. The bunches are four times more. For example, they live two times more. So the sound is like uh, like light. So why is this happening? Is there a logical explanation, or is the reason far stranger? Could the soaring sounds of Bach and Mozart's delicate ditties revolutionize the way we treat our greenery? Researchers discovered that popular tracks such as Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Waters and Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony improved milk yield in dairy cows by as much as one liter per day. Why? Because calming music was found to reduce stress in the animals. Happy moose equals more milk. Could something similar be happening with plants? Could relaxed grapes with impeccable musical taste ripen quicker? Could plants have an intelligence science has yet to fathom? Botanist Dr. Jadeep Mathor says that the grapevine's response to music can be simply explained. Basically, we are talking about vibrations. Plants are able to uh, exhibit primary perception, where they can pick up happenings from their surroundings, and that can be read out as electrical impulses. As far as classical music is concerned, perhaps there are certain 
tones, certain timbre, certain levels of vibration that plants are more responsive to in that particular music. Sound waves are vibrations in the air made up of different frequencies. The vibrations caused by the sound of music can be felt by the plants in their leaves or in the soil. Research suggests that plants may respond to music by increasing the expression of the genes, stimulating growth. So do plants just feel music rather than hearing it? Is the perceived wrath of grapes or joy just a boring biological response based on sound vibrations? Maybe. But Susan Dudley, a plant evolutionary ecologist, has another theory for why Carlo's grapevines grow so dramatically. And it may have something to do with how the plants in the vineyards are related to each other. Every plant has a mother and a father. And the vineyard in Tuscany could be doing better because they're planted next to their siblings. For some plants, we know the plants do do better when they're planted next to their siblings. And what my research does is show a possible mechanism for that, that they're not producing these competitive behaviors when they're with their siblings. So that's a plausible theory. To create a consistent grape, most vineyards use cuttings from healthy plants, then graft them onto rootstock. This means that often, most of the vines in a given field are genetically related clones. I went looking to see whether plants could recognize who their relatives were and behave differently with those relatives. What we found is that plants respond differently to liquid in which other seedlings had been in. So you put a seedling in the liquid, you take it out, you put your test seedling in and you measure it. And it will grow more roots if that first seedling was a stranger, but it won't grow more roots if that first seedling was a sibling. And we had a control where we just lifted them out and put them back in again. So we definitely see that there's something, something soluble, some kind of chemical maybe that the roots probably put into the liquid that they're responding to. But we don't know what it is. Plants compete for limited resources like sunlight, nutrients, and water, meaning there are winners and losers in this equation. Dudley's research has shown that when certain plants grow beside their kin, they work together for mutual survival and are more likely to all do well. With a winery, usually vintners are, are planting all the same kind. They're not planting very different kinds together, so rather than better sharing because they're different, they might be sharing better because they're less competitive with each other. Okay, okay. And maybe I am barking up the wrong tree. Sorry. Seriously. What if the grapes of Tuscany and, and, and plants in general don't ripen or respond or grow tall and healthy because they love music? What if it's because they love each other? But can this sibling explanation sufficiently solve the mystery in the Italian vineyard? Family ties may make the vines grow better, but why would only some vines grow toward the speaker? Could the answer be far stranger than anything even science fiction writers might imagine? Could, as many researchers believe, vines and other plants be sentient beings, capable of displaying conscious choice? I, I believe plants can sense now whether they can sense precisely our thoughts or the thoughts of other animals around them really remains to be proven. So I wouldn't go so far as saying that, yeah, they have the ESP and everything. However, what I definitely can say is they would be influenced very easily by, their, by changes in their environment. And that maybe reflects to a certain extent the thought process we do not know. J. Deep and his assistant Zach are going to put the sentient being theory to the test. They're going to hook up this plant to a state-of-the-art polygraph. Sensors will read the subtle changes in the plant's electrical activity to see how it responds to various stimuli. If there's a noticeable spike in the plant's electrical activity, 
then that would suggest that the plant can read human thoughts. I'm absolutely curious about what is the outcome from this particular experiment because it might actually uh, be an opening uh, for the way my own research direction that will uh, move into. Because if there's a positive, uh, positive response, I would really love to follow that up in a more scientific manner. For their first experiment, they're going to test what many gardeners believe to be a fact, that plants respond well to human touch. Lightly brushing the leaves and the stems of the plant. No, sorry, Zach. But there's no response. Now they're going to attempt what few scientists have ever tried before. Threatening thoughts. They're going to see if plants have ESP. No response so far. That's all I got. Yeah. We haven't gotten any responses yet, eh? Since there's no response, JG and Zach are going to raise the intensity of the next experiment. They're going to threaten the plant with violence. Cut plant. Hold on. So as soon as you were on the way to cut it, there's a huge spike. That's really interesting because it was at a lower level, spiked up, came down, went up again, and then has now started resting at another level. So the spike actually comes prior to your action. Amazingly, before he could cut the plant, there's a noticeable spike on the lie detector indicating a physiological response by the plant. That would suggest that the plant could read Zach's mind. This was almost the perfect moment for a plant to have become anxious when you reached it with a scissors with a very clear intention, at least in your mind, unspoken. So, again, maybe, maybe we are looking at something real. Scientifically speaking, this hardly would count as a result unless we could repeat it multiple times. But the fact is, and it's a very, it's, it comes as a major surprise to me, uh, because I was not expecting this at all. And we had already gone through one plant and looked at the other one and gone through different uh, situations where we realized this is not happening. And then suddenly, when Zach moves in with a scissor, and I guess with a very clear intention of carrying the threat out, uh, there, there is a very, very clear spike. So, if human beings are ever going to prove plants are sentient or have ESP, more research needs to be done. If it's ever proven true, the implications would be enormous. It would shake the very foundations of our human existence and necessitate a dramatic change in the way we relate with this mysterious species. Is that weird or what? So three weird mysteries. A multitude of even weirder possible explanations. A woman materializes from nowhere into an LA bathroom. Did she use a wormhole to travel through time? Did she travel faster than light speed? Is any of this possible? A mysterious stone structure in New England. Proof that the ancient Celts settled the United States? Was this built by Native Americans? Or was it created in more recent times as a booze-making factory? Vines in Italy seemingly respond to the sounds of Mozart. Are plants sentient beings with human feelings and desires? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?